we've talked a lot about the pre-Vatican II mass or the Trident II mass, but we have uh, But I thought tonight we would start by going through the mass uh, step by step with a view to you know, sort of analyzing it. And particularly, so one of the things we often fail to appreciate, and probably I sort of recently discovered I sometimes over appreciate when uh, it, it isn't quite appropriate, but one of the things we frequently fail to appreciate is behind every action or behind many actions, there's often a theology. And failing to do that, we, uh, we often um, present Christianity in a way that's less than favorable, since the, the irony is that in the secular world, people, including atheists who don't even believe in God, pick up on that theology and then use it to denounce the faith. So, I, so the Tridentine Mass so the, the, the Tridentine Mass, the, the basic shape of the Mass uh, was a result of uh, uh, a document from, I think, Pope Pius V in 1570. So it's part of the, the reforms of uh, the Catholic Counter-Reformation. And it represented an attempt to uh, standardized worship among Catholic churches throughout the world, and especially to eliminate deviant practices that uh, had crept into the mass. So there's a way that in its time, the Tridentine mass was probably necessary and progressive in 1570. So the, the mass is divided into two basic parts, the mass of the catechumens and the mass of the faithful. The mass of the, the uh, catechumens includes what is now called the introductory rites and the liturgy of the word. So the mass begins with the entrance procession, the uh, the priest then signs the cross and begin has quiet prayers at the foot of the altar. Uh, he recites uh, a verse from Psalm 42 of the Septuagint. I go into the altar of God, to God who gives joy to my youth. And then either he or the acolytes, I don't remember, I have it, didn't note it in my notes. Say uh, from Psalm 123, again in the Septuagint, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And at that point, the priest does the confidio, which is pretty, well, actually is somewhat different. So notice the difference. I confess to Almighty God, to blessed Mary ever virgin, to blessed Michael the archangel, to blessed John the Baptist, to the holy apostles, Peter and Paul, to all the saints and to you brethren, that I, I have sinned exceedingly in thought, word and deed through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I beseech blessed Mary ever virgin, blessed Michael the archangel, blessed John the Baptist, the holy apostles, Peter and Paul, all the saints, and you, brethren, to pray for me to the Lord our God. This is in Latin. Uh, and then the acolytes or the servers say, may almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you your sins, and bring you to everlasting life. And then we have the same confidior repeated by the acolytes with uh, 
you father, replacing the phrase, you brethren. And then the priest responds with the same, may almighty God have mercy on you, etc. So are there any thoughts about that? I'm glad we changed. <laughs> I like the way it is now, opposed to all that. How come? Well, um, I, I guess I, I, uh, part of it is just, I, I don't, uh, naming all the saints and, and that, I think it, it depends on where each one of us is from, it, or we are in our in the stages in our, our, our life and our, our um, walk in through the Catholic Church is just, uh, I, I just like more simplistic uh, mm -hmm. prayer, I guess, is what what I'm thinking. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's extremely repetitive. We have Almighty God. The current form is, I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters. Here is Almighty God, Blessed Mary, Ever-Virgin, Blessed Michael, the Archangel, Blessed John the Baptist, the Holy Apostles, Peter and Paul, all the saints, and then to you, brethren. And then that's repeated again at the end. Therefore, I beseech Blessed Mary, Ever Virgin, etc. So it's extremely repetitive. What else about it? Doesn't anyone find it a little bit weird? Yeah, it was, it's like just the priest is, is um, asking for forgiveness. Uh huh, right. Well, actually, you know, in the first version of the, in the first iteration of the video, the priest is acting, asking for forgiveness. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's okay, I suppose. And the thing is that it's the servers of the acolytes who are, are asking God to forgive them. So that seems, you know, a little bit strange. And then in the second iteration, we have the acolytes reciting the confidior and the priest forgiving them. So we have two repetitions of the confidior. So it, a very repetitive action, but something's really missing. I like that now we say, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. Mm -hmm. um, recognizing that our wrongs that we do to each other, and even if it's not directly to another person, when we have sinned, our, uh, our aura, our feeling about ourselves is not up to par. And therefore, it does affect the rest of the community. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But one so. of the things after Vatican II that I liked was that we weren't beating our breast about how sinful we were, you know. Um, and uh -huh. out of out of that constant feeling of unworthiness there were people not accepting communion and not taking part at, in in the uh, the formation of the mass or not the formation but you know uh, the presentation of the mass the, the action of the mass yes thank yes. you and and i think vatican ii tried to help us see in spite of our weaknesses and our errors, we are inherently good because we are made in the image and likeness of God. And so I don't beat my breast when we say the confidior. Mm -hmm. I'm not going back to that. So, so nobody has noticed what's missing in all of this repetition and verbosity? Well, um... We're not included, the community is not included in it. Yeah, exactly. So the priest, I mean, there is real forgiveness of sin mm -hmm. in the confidior. Yeah. 
And so at least, and you know, we can debate about which sins are forgiven and which aren't, but nevertheless, there's real forgiveness of sin. But so the, the priest's sins are forgiven. The servers or acolytes' sins are forgiven. But what about everybody else? And so there are, there are two possibilities here, really. One is that they don't matter. So who cares about them? And the other is that their sins are forgiven too by some magical process. You know, they're not included in the confidior, they're just watching it, watching it as a passive step spectator brings no benefits, brings no forgiveness, and brings no grace. So therefore, if their sins are supposed to be forgiven, it has to be by, by magic, right? Well, weren't and, we... And magic, and magic is not acceptable. Hmm. But weren't we um, all supposed to go to confession? And that's where our sins were forgiven? Rather than be forgiven in the community, because that's one that's one note that I've always kept in the back of my mind. That some people think because they say I confess to you, to Almighty God, and to you, my brothers and sisters, they feel that that's they're forgiven at that time, rather than going to the sacrament, the confession, and and being forgiven by God and stuff. So, but maybe I'm not thinking it right. So, well, the question is, I, I don't really want to go into it sort of in a lot of detail, but I mean, there's a question of which, what sins are forgiven in the confidior. So okay. Okay. one of the, one of the, the you know, kinds of sins that is forgiven are sort of unknowing sins. You know, so for example, uh, you're having, not feeling, you know, very whatever, very good one morning you're sort of feeling like the world is persecuting you and everyone hates you and I see you and I say good morning with kind of a, a not very uh, you know sort of so I say good morning without a sort of tone of I'm glad to see you the tone is more like ah. and so you feel hurt by that I mean, this is hypothetical. So without knowing it and without actually meaning that, I've hurt you, and that's a sin. But it's not an intentional one. So those kinds of sins are forgiven by video, definitely. But so in any case, the point is that, but forgiven very much like going to confession, forgiveness of sin requires active participation. So if you're watching the acolytes and the priests have their sins forgiven, you're not participating. So we get off to a bad start with the mass because an important part of the confidior is that it's also not only an expression of our sinfulness, but our, an expression of our humility. And by not participating, the laity are just completely excluded from that. It's kind of as if they're not there, or even more importantly, that they don't matter. So after the confidior, this is actually all before the priest goes to the altar. The After the confidior, the priest recites Psalm 84 in the Septuagint. Incidentally, the, there's a different numbering system in our Bibles and in the Septuagint. So Psalm 84 in the Septuagint and Psalm 85 in the Masoretic text. And here we have the priest saying something and the acolytes responding. So the priest says, you will turn, O God, and bring us to life. 
And that's why I'd say, and your people shall rejoice in you. He says, this is all in Latin. Everything is all in Latin. Show us, O oh Lord, your mercy, acolytes, and grant us your salvation. Priest, O oh Lord, hear my prayer, acolytes, and let my cry come to you. And the priest says, the Lord be with you, the acolytes, and with your spirit. And then the priest says, let us pray, ascends to the altar, and has silent prayer. Then he makes a sign of the cross, followed by usually a reading from a psalm. And then we have Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. Does, uh, is there anything striking about that? Within the current context of, uh, you know, people who really like the Tridentine Mass because it preserves our Latin language heritage. So, what languages Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison? It's Greek, eleison. isn't it? It's Greek, right? And why is it Greek? Well, is it part because it stems from the Byzantine? No, in fact, it doesn't. The Mass in Rome was celebrated in Greek originally. Oh. It was only celebrated in Latin later. It, it was only in the third century, if I recall correctly, that it was began to be celebrated in Latin. Interesting. So, so from the viewpoint of you know traditionalism, that you know we should celebrate the Latin Mass because that's the you know, uh, I, in a defense of the, the Latin mass, I read today that someone said that it's been um, celebrated for 1500 years. And um, it's not the original mass. So, you know, if we're to, to plead tradition, then, you know, there's a strong argument to be made that we should go back to Greek instead of Latin. Yes. So we then have Gloria. We then have the collect. And then we move to what is the beginning of what today would be called the liturgy of the word. So we have a reading from an epistle, usually from Paul, and that's in Latin too. Only in 2007 did Pope Benedict XVI allow it to be read in a vernacular language. There's then a singing of the psalm followed by Alleluia. Then the priest prays, cleanse my heart and my lips, O Almighty God, who cleanse the lips of the prophet. Then the gospel reading in Latin. Next is a homily in the vernacular, but it's optional until Pope Paul VI made it mandatory. So what does that mean? The, the liturgy of the word, the, the shape of the liturgy of the word. What does it mean? Yeah, that, that form, the form of the liturgy of the word. The, the, the reading from the epistle, the reading from the gospel, the optional homily. What are the implications of that? Well, if they were reading, were they reading them in Latin? You're reading them in Latin, right? Yeah, only in 2007 can the epistle be read in English. 
Uh, not English, in the vernacular language. In 2007? Uh-huh. For the Trinitarian, right? Or the Tritidine. 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 Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Well, it would mean that if you weren't fluent in Latin, you were not getting any instruction from the Word of God. Uh-huh. That's what it means. Yeah, God's Word is supposed to be, as Hebrew says, active. Is it like a two-edged sword? Right? So God's word is active. The, the, uh, you know, the, the theology of the Mass in Vatican II holds that God is speaking his word. And so God's word should be penetrating us. But if we don't understand God's word, there's nothing to penetrate. Unless again we, you know, resort to this kind of almost magical view that simply by being there, <clears throat> something penetrates us. When I, I'm looking at my grandmother's missal from 1959, <laughs> and so it's pre-Vatican, and yeah. it, I I took it with me when I went to boarding school. Um, in Vancouver, and it, I went in in 61, and Vatican II happened during the two years I was there, and I remember our daily mass in the morning using this missile, and it has the gospel in, on one side, it's in English, and then on the other side, it's in Latin. And I do remember reading the English, and it must have been when the priest was reading it in Latin so that I could tell what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, and the epistle is the same. It's in both English and Latin. Um, is, is that a full lectionary? Um, I remember has... that too, Michelle, and it was just for that mass. The, the church used to give it out to the to the parishioners, and then oh, you well, give this... it and then you gave it back to them. It was kind of fun to have my grandmother's missile. <laughs> That's very fun. That's very nice. Yeah, yeah. So we have everything in Latin, but an optional homily which may not exist which may not happen. So we have Bible read in a language no one understands. Uh, so maybe you have the translation available to you. Um, for our masses, I, you know, when I was little, I, I <coughs> only remember, you know, sort of lang English, Latin, Latin and then English translation for, you know, sort of the, the non-changing parts of the mass, so not the gospel or not the readings. And, and if no homily, there's you know, sort of no instruction, no way to deepen your knowledge of, of the word of God, no teaching sort of really, uh, you know, potentially you're purely a spectator of mass at this point. Then we have uh, the creed, where, um, where it's the, at the point of, that the incarnation is mentioned, for the first time, the congregation becomes involved, which is nice. They you know, bow and genuflect um, with the mention of the incarnation. And we then move to the Mass of the Faithful, that division between Mass of the Catechumens and Mass of the Faithful is a very old one from the period in which Catechumens had to leave the Mass at the end of the Mass of the Catechumens, so after the recitation of the Creed, and uh, they weren't allowed to be present for the liturgy of the Eucharist or for the Mass of the Faithful. 
So the Mass of the Faithful begins with uh, the greeting, the Lord be with you and with your spirit, uh, an invitation to pray, the priest prays an offertory verse. He uh, has a prayer of humble access. He holds the pattern with the host at breast level and prays that God may accept the spotless victim for his own innumerable sins, offenses, and neglects for all those present and for all faithful Christians, living and dead. May it avail uh, unto salvation of himself and those mentioned. Does anyone see anything wrong with this? May God accept the spotless victim? Well, why wouldn't he accept the spotless victim? But he's also accepting us. Um, well, what is it that he's being asked to accept? Sounds like Christ to me. Right. Right. What? Christ. He, he, it, the spotless Did victim is Jesus. Uh, no, no, it's not Christ. It's bread. Oh, the bread. There's been no consecration yet. It's bread. Oh. Until the consecration, the bread is bread, the wine is wine. This ah. is bread. And it's being called the spotless victim. Interesting. In Latin, of course. So we have the prayer of humble access, then we have the mixing of water and wine, right? So the water and wine is still, is wine that's now mixed with water. Then we incense the offerings with prayer from Psalm 142 in the Septuagint. And then the thurible is given to the deacon who incenses the priest and the other ministers. And here the congregation gets to participate. They get incense too. So the offerings are being incensed, which, and we, we discussed this earlier. I think we discussed it in our first week of the uh, discussing the liturgy, but at least to me, though, this, uh, doing this is. I kind of look at that. I kind of look at that as making the gifts, uh, purifying the gifts. That's how I always kind of look at it. Even though, I mean, they're just the gifts at this point. But. Yeah, that, that's the problem. They're just the gifts at this point. So, um, in the liturgical action, I mean, so in, in, in you know, the, the basic liturgical action of Vatican II, in the consecration, it's God who sends his Holy Spirit to us so god rushes to us to transform the gifts so in that case what does smoke rising up to god accomplish when there's only ordinary bread and wine i mean i i would argue that it uh, accomplishes conveying the impression that it's the offering that really matters and especially, you know, the money. Well, what about when um, the smoke is offered and it is, you know, like dosed out to the people? I mean, maybe. I'm just, no, I'm just not a fan. I mean, incense has its place, but not before the consecration when it's ordinary bread and wine. So, okay. yeah, just... 
I'm just not a fan. I mean, I, I you know, sort of can can see it, and 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 admittedly, it's better going out to the people than just simply incensing the gifts, which are only bread and wine and money at this point. But so then after that, we have the washing of hands along with recitation from Psalm 26, verses 6 to 12 of the Septuagint. We, um, we have a prayer to the Trinity, asking that the Trinity receive the oblation being made in remembrance of the passion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Does anyone notice anything strange about that? About the washing of the, of the hands? No, after the washing of the hands, asking that the praying that the Trinity may receive the ablation being made in remembrance of the passion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Is there anything strange about that? Well, you would think that God would know that already. Um, yeah, yeah. Although, you know, when we talk about God's remembrance, what we're really, in a lot of ways, reminding ourselves that we should remember, since we ourselves tend to forget. Uh, but 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 what else? Asking the divine Trinity may receive the oblation, the offering. I don't understand how oblation is meant there. Receive the uh, receive the offering. Receive the sacrifice. Okay. Nobody sees anything strange here. I don't understand. It's still, it's still bread and wine. Why? How have bread and wine become such a big deal? Is it because they're works of our hands? Well, I mean that's that's why that's why we um, that's why there is bread and wine, yes. But the problem here is that why are we offering bread and wine to God? Is that why that it's, prayer is not in the current mass, or yeah, is that? Exactly. Exactly, the consecration. So the basic order of mass of the consecration is that we pray over the gifts that the priest does. There's an epiclesis, which is the invocation of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit transforms the gifts. There's then a second epiclesis, in which the Holy Spirit combines our sacrifice with the blood and body and blood of Christ, which were transformed from bread and wine by the first epiclesis. And then those are offered back to God the Father. So the liturgical action is very clear. It's focused, driven by the activity of the Holy Spirit. And you know, it proceeds in logical order. Here, uh, the, the, the statement that this would make is that God is in need of bread and wine. I guess you know, he maybe wants to eat, drink, and be merry. And God uh, you know, as a fundamental theological statement, has no needs. God is self-sufficient. In fact, God is the creator of all things ex nihilo, out of nothing. So the notion that God needs bread and wine is 
ridiculous. So does that make sense? Yes. We then have the priest turning to the congregation, which is nice, and says, let us pray, brothers, or rate fratres. He then turns his back again on the congregation and silently prays, pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Father Almighty. Then the servers respond with, may the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands, etc." Priest responds, amen. Uh, the priest says the prayer for the day and concludes with all forever and ever. And this, here again, the congregation becomes involved. Uh, the servers in the congregation say, Amen. Then the consecration begins. There is a the priest says, the Lord be with you. The acolytes say, and with your spirit. Priest says, lift up your hearts. The acolytes say, we lift them up to the Lord. Uh, priest says, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. The acolytes say, it is right and just. There's a preface prayer, and then the rule of consecration. First, intercessions. Praying for the living that God may guard, unite, and govern the church together with the Pope. Then specific living people are mentioned and the congregation and the church, then uh, Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, apostles, some popes, other martyrs, and, and all you saints. Then there are preparatory prayers. Then the consecration proper from the cons uh, Last Supper verses in chapter 22, verse rather, verses chapter 22 of Luke, along with the mystery of faith. That comes from Summa. Uh, then the offering of the victim to God, which we also saw earlier, although here the, um, the consecration has happened with the prayer that God accept the offering and command his holy angel to carry the offering to God's altar on high, so that those who receive the body and blood of Christ may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Then there's the remembrance of the dead, prayer for the con uh, congregation, the end of the canon with the doxology, through him and with him and in him, O oh God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours. Uh, that's spoken silently while making five signs of the cross. And then the priest replaces the host on the corporal, and the pall on the chalice and genuflex. And the priest sings forever and ever to conclude the doxology. And the acolytes respond, amen. So is, is anything missing there? So we have <clears throat> the words of institution. So how are how is the transubstantiation achieved? How are bread and wine transformed into body and blood of Christ? It's when the the priest asks for um it, when he does that consecration, when he asks for that to be, um, I forgot the exact wording of it now, but at that at that time when the priest asked for it, that's when it changed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> in, in, in the, the Vatican, the post-Vatican II Mass from a, a Eucharistic prayer to make holy, therefore, these gifts we pray by sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us 
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Eucharistic Amen. prayer three, therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you by the same spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. So that's called the Epiclesis. The Epiclesis is a very old part of Mass. So, for example, um, St. Cyril of Jerusalem in his uh, mystagogical lecture five, which discusses the Eucharist. Um, interestingly, in consecration has no Last Supper verses. He discusses the Last Supper verses in uh, mystagogical lecture four, where he uh, provides sort of the theological basis of the Eucharist. And in mystagogical lecture five, he has the liturgical action of the Eucharist. And so he has no Last Supper verses, but only an epiclesis. This is written uh, roughly about 350 or 60. So epiclesis is a very old part of mass. Uh, and the Last Supper verses, not a standard part of mass um, you know, throughout uh, the Christian world. So there's no epiclesis. So the question then becomes, how do the gifts become transformed and transubstantiated? Right, if they're not invoking the Holy Spirit to do that, that got skipped. Uh-huh, right, right. And then we have communion, we have the Lord's Prayer followed by a fraction of the host, the commingling, the, the, uh, we have Agnus Dei, we have um, the pox, the priest asking Christ to look not at the priest's sins, but at the faith of Christ's church. So notice, look not on at my sins, whereas in today the wording is look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. Then we have prayers preparatory to communion. Then we have the communion rite, receiving the body and blood <coughs> of our Lord. Serving communion to others. And then the, uh, then the conclusion and the final blessing. So that's the Tridentine Mass. Is that the current Tridentine Mass? The one that... Uh, did you say yes? Yes, that's the current... Well, oh. that, uh, there's not a current Tridentine Mass. It's uh, largely the same Tridentine Mass you know, that's existed since 1570, except that, you know, I mean, there have been some changes, especially... I think additions of saints every year and there has been a, a, a proliferation of feast days over the, the, uh, you know, the uh, period since 1570. And then some minor changes you know, like the, uh, the uh, epistle can be read in vernacular language starting with Paul VI, but That's not the current, the Tridentine Mass isn't the current uh, Mass of the Roman Rite from Vatican II, which can still be you know, celebrated uh, without restriction. Tridentine Mass is restricted. So there is some, uh, I think, peculiar ordering 
and the Trident team mass, but I think reflect in some cases some uh, the theological problems. And, and the big thing is that the laity are passive participants. They're not active participants. One of the, I mean, I, I mentioned that thing I read with, you know, the, the, the mass has been celebrated for 1500 years when, you know, in fact, the Tridentine mass starts in 1570. So it clearly hasn't been celebrated for 1500 years. The, uh, another argument for the Latin mass, the Tridentine mass is that it's being in Latin really indicates that we are one single people of God, one single Catholic church. Does anyone have any opinions about that? When I was living in Japan um, on Saturday night, the five o'clock mass at the cathedral was in Latin for the sake of all the visitors, the tourists, Catholic tourists that came. So for that very reason that you said, Ron, that no matter what our personal vernacular was, we could all take part in the Latin. However, <laughs> I was mm -hmm. 30 years old and had not been used to having a Latin mass in such a long time. Um, it, it didn't help me to feel um, that I was worshiping with all these people that were from all corners of the world. It would have been, I would have felt the very, I would have felt that even if it had been in Japanese, like our regular Sunday mass was. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. we've traveled to Europe and we have been to mass in different language, different vernacular languages. And it was wonderful to be able to recognize, I mean, even if I couldn't understand the individual words, I recognized where we were in the mass and that it was um, done. The action of the mass was the same wherever we went. Mm -hmm. And it was a wonderful feeling, but it didn't have to be in Latin to have that good feeling. Right. Mm -hmm. The, the, um, in, in a lot of ways, I mean, the, the experience of being a, a, the experience of whether or not we are a single Catholic church, you know, I think varies regionally and whatever. Um, so the question is, does, Latin unite us when we're otherwise divided. And so looking at my hometown, we have three Catholic churches in a town of 10,000 people. Uh, there was the Irish Italian church that included the, uh, the remaining original French settlers of the area. Um, there was the Croatian, Slovenian, Slovak church, and there was the Polish church. The Polish church originally had been a single church with the uh, Croats, Slovenians, and Slovaks, but the Croats, Slovenians, and Slovaks didn't like the Poles. So they formed a separate church. So that was obviously not one people of God. Well, you know, at that time, things were very segregated. I mean, right, people things were very them. segregated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But 
that's a, a problem of you know, the, in many ways, the sinfulness of world culture or national culture defining the church rather than Christian culture or the values of Christianity penetrating society. The church should you know, at least have an awareness of uh, the church should not embrace the sinfulness of surrounding culture. And here it did. So in contrast to the, the unifying factor of, of, of Latin, uh, our text um, focuses on enculturation and on the greater di the diversity of the church in the contemporary world. Does anyone have any thoughts about that? I don't think I understand your question, just because I'm old. <laughs> well, what's increasingly uniting us today is that we are a single people of God who worship together despite our enormous diversity and enormous cultural, racial, ethnic, whatever differences. And those differences are becoming, you know, are, are increasingly embraced. The Catholic Church is, you know, sort of increasingly a worldwide church that has a large, a large presence in in Asia, in Africa, in Central and Latin America. Uh, whereas, you know, the, the particularly the, the hierarchy of the church, uh, especially in pre-Vatican II times, was almost exclusively white, European, or American. And so in you know, recognizing the importance of individual cultures in recognizing that all humankind bears the divine image, we can unite the person of Jesus and not unite in a common language that nobody understands. Well, the fact that when we have mass, um, it's done the same way everywhere in the world with different languages. I mean, um, that's always been toted as one of the advantages of Catholicism. You kind of know where you are, you can follow along in the missile, despite the fact that you don't recognize what's being said, you know what's, what's being said to a certain extent. Um, and, you know, I think the Latin is really kind of mystical. It's kind of a mystical connection. Mm -hmm. That nobody understands but if if i go to mass in a foreign country i don't understand what they're saying yeah oh. yeah i think you're right that it's kind of a mystical connection mm -hmm. so vatican ii also called for the need for um liturgical formation for all catholics oh, yeah. as that happens well, it has, it has in a, I mean, I, in the 20 years I've been in the church, I've noticed there's a lot more uh, 
more uh, liturgical information being offered, more classes. It used to be the, there weren't a lot of Bible studies for, you know, Catholic people were going to Bible studies at Protestant churches. And now there's, you know, there's lots of Bible studies at Catholic churches. And, um, you know, people have been encouraged like to take the three-year catechist course if they wanted to teach. Um, mm -hmm. And there's been other opportunities for adult education that people don't necessarily take advantage of, but there are opportunities for it. I feel. Mm -hmm. Right, there are opportunities for it, but people don't necessarily take advantage. Right. And, yeah, I mean, that's a, in many ways, that's a problem. Yes. It's, uh, I mean, in order to actively participate, it's important to understand the mass. Right. Well, do you think people, I mean, know what's going on in the mass to a certain extent because they've read the missal? You know, I remember the first time I went to mass that, you know, a good Catholic woman took me under her wing and she explained to me everything that was happening. Mm -hmm. And then, and then through my involvement in RCIA for many years, you know, I learned a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, don't, I, you know, I, I guess we don't really know what people know. I mean, they know mm -hmm. what they know, but we cannot yeah, assume I get that the they sense, do or don't. I got the sense that most people don't know. Okay. And, and that the mass oh, yes. is you know, sort of very much a ritual. Right. Yeah, I agree. The importance of ritual in the liturgy is so ritual has both an enormous strength and an enormous danger. The strength of ritual is that it allows you to focus on, because it's the same every time, it allows you to focus on the underlying meaning of the ritual. And uh, you know allows you because it's simply customary. You don't have to deal, you know, kind of this newness and with unfamiliarity, but you know can use the ritual to um, more deeply understand what's going on, more deeply draw closer to God. And worship God, you know, from familiarity rather than you know unfamiliarity. So I mean, you can you can say the, the kind of a, a, a sort of miniature example of that with with music. When a familiar song is played, it's much easier to sing and participate because. You know, you know it. And so you can really kind of join in and you can, you know, worship with passion. As opposed to typically when there's a new song, it's kind of like, well, how, how do you sing this? And am I singing it okay? Is this, is this good? And so mm -hmm. instead of using it as you know, sort of a tool for worship and to draw closer to God, it becomes you know, sort of introspective and you know sort of uncomfortable almost until you become used to it and so you know the, the, the thing about ritual is that since it's the same all the time you can you know, sort of draw closer to god so that's the strength the weakness or the danger is that because it's ritual it's the same old thing every time and you lose its meaning and so you end up just doing it because it's ritual and that's the way it's been done. And then, of course, the problem with that is that the mass is an important way of drawing close to God. And most importantly, the mass is a vehicle for receiving God's grace 
so that we can fulfill Christ's commission as we're sent out into the world. Masa means to send, right? And so if it's simply ritual, then there's no medium for receiving grace. It's just ritual. And, and the only grace can come through magic. And we don't believe in magic. So that's what makes it really important to understand the liturgy. I was in visiting Boise a few years ago, and I attended mass because Saturday night, Saturday evening mass, because I like to go to mass. And I had my brother with me, who's not Catholic. Anyway, the priest, it was a full house. It was a big church. And he, and he spent 45 minutes instructing. I don't remember what he was instructing us on, but instructing, you know, on something like what goes on at the mass. It was something like that. I don't know uh -huh. if it was about the mass. And I thought what, I thought that was a great thing to do. I mean, he did this on top of the, on top of the service and he was very good at it. And I mm -hmm. thought this is a great way for people to learn, like say about the mass. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I've never seen I've never seen that anyplace else. Now, that is a great way to learn mm -hmm. about the mass. Yeah. Yeah, very definitely. I remember I remember once an uh, eleven year old boy told me when I was uh, doing the children's liturgy, he says, you know. He says, I've heard those stories so many times. I just can't bear to listen to them one more time. <laughs> and I, I didn't feel that way at all. I thought, you know, I thought, oh, I love to hear the stories. But, you know, it was interesting because it, hearing that Bible story again wasn't doing anything for him. Mm -hmm. I thought that was very interesting. It's something to think about. Well, that yeah, I mean, that is something to think about because, I mean, the problem is that they're not stories. We've, right. come, to see, we've come to see them as stories, but when we see them as stories, we tend to lose their meaning. Well, really, you don't think that the, we could call the gospel, the gospel readings a story? Um, I think that I mean, we call them stories, but I think that calling them stories tends to, in many ways, trivialize them. It's and, true. And that's a, that's true. a significant problem. You know, so in mm -hmm. fact, you know, we tend to see, um, and, and it's not only Catholicism, I think it's you know, much of Christianity. And I think in many ways, it's even less Catholicism than uh, you know, sort of evangelical fundamentalism. Uh, but when we, we see it as, as you know, these discrete stories, you know, so now Jesus is healing a leper, and now Jesus is healing a blind man. The, the problem is that the Gospel writers weren't writing stories. They were writing what were integrated theological works. And right. so when we abstract or you know take out a story, we lose the context and we lose the broader meaning. Um, you know, so for example, in Matthew's gospel, after giving the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus comes down and heals a leper. And so if we take it as a story, that's really neat. Jesus has healed a leper. But Matthew is making a much broader statement. Jesus has just preached the Sermon on the Mount which is significant uh, because I mean, the mountain is a place of revelation. The mountain is a place where you know, Moses received 
the law and instead of receiving the new covenant, if we can call the Sermon on the Mount that, or receiving a new law, Jesus is speaking it because he is the source of revelation. He then goes down the mountain. He encounters a leper on the way down. Leprosy is you know, the worst possible thing that can happen to a human being in under the Mosaic law. And I mean, we see leprosy as Hansen's disease, and you know, kind of like leprosy as it's common in India, for example. But leprosy in the Old Testament is any of a variety of skin diseases. It's not only Hansen's disease. It can be acne. It can be virtually anything. And it segregates you from society. So Jesus comes down, touches a leper, and heals him. Under the Mosaic law, when you touch a leper, you become ceremonially unclean. You have to purify yourself. Even coming into contact with a leper's shadow makes you unclean. That's why they have to wander around. They have a sign and they have to wander around yelling, unclean, unclean, so everybody can get out of the way. And they're not supposed to be near anybody anyway. So the point of the whole thing, of the healing, isn't merely that Jesus healed somebody. It's that he touched and healed somebody who was unclean. So a fundamental presupposition of the Mosaic law and also a presupposition of many Christians is that when the unclean touches the clean, the clean becomes unclean. When the unholy touches the holy, the holy becomes unholy. So we see that in Christianity all the time. What Matthew is saying is that when the holy touches the unholy, the unholy becomes holy. When the clean touches the unclean, the unclean becomes clean. The leper who is unholy and unclean no longer is unholy and unclean after Jesus touches him. So that's a fundamental you know, theological proposition. And if we see this as a story, we miss it. Well, so. I mean, being able to have that enlightenment into the scripture is what makes Bible study so rich. And mm -hmm. for kids in children's liturgy, um, it's it's unfortunate when they look at it that way, because I know I've been there before where I think, oh my gosh, I've heard this so many times. And yet there are other times when if I'm actively listening to the gospel or one of the epistles, I'll think, oh my gosh, I don't remember noticing that before, or I didn't hear it that way before. And mm -hmm. that's why right. it, it's the living word, because we get new insight. Mm -hmm. um, right. And right. And there are and literally an infinite number of ways to look at and be inspired by and to view un, deep, more deeply understand God through particular passages. And that's why actively listening is so important. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Not just with our spouses or our friends, but when we are hearing the word of God in, um, in mass. We, we actively listen to spouses? <laughs> it's important if we yes. do. You're supposed to. You're supposed to listen to spouses. Uh, 
it's a good thing to do. I agree. <laughs> We're out of time. Well, I like to say that when I when we heard the mass in Latin, somehow I felt more spiritually touched, even though I didn't quite understand the language. I felt spiritual in a way because it felt like I understood what was being said. I could feel the the spirit in the air. I could, you know, uh -huh. I could feel the presence, and and that's what I thought. Well, that that's kind of important, you know. And then when it became English in in our in our tongue. In our uh, standard English, it seems like I lost some of that that spiritual spirituality, and I had to relearn it, of course. Uh -huh. know, recapture it, you know. And then when I when I made the connection that Christ was with us every Sunday at Mass, that He is a part of Mass, I gave thanks to that, and and now I, it makes I understand it a lot better, and I feel uh -huh. a lot closer. To that present. Yeah. Uh huh. So, you know, it kind of sounds like the, the, the phenomenon you're describing is, you know, a function of the positive side of ritual. You know, so, you're familiar with the Latin Mass, so it allows you to, um, it allows you to focus on the mysteries of the Mass. And so then when it changes to English, it's harder to focus on the mysteries of the mass because it's now in English, that's not familiar and it requires a reorientation. Then once you reorient, you can then again begin to focus on the mysteries of the mass. Yes, that was my experience too, Derek. But it was in 72 that I, um i got the reorientation into um the the vernacular mass and um the teachings of vatican ii and so it's very difficult for me when i feel like we're going back to the other yeah yeah yeah, I've never liked the Latin Mass, um, especially. You know, I mean, it was. Uh, it seemed just filled with condemnation, and and a lot of that you know, is the individual priest and your parish. But you know, for hours it was filled with condemnation, and fire and brimstone. And, uh, the big thing I remember during the priest homily was that he would actually cry as he yelled, you're all going to help. Why are you such sinners? As he shouted, it was uh, you know, not, not pleasant. Um, so, you know, just as Latin Mass has never been my favorite at all. And, and the pre-Vatican church has also just not been my favorite. Years ago, when I was at another parish, the priest took about a month and every Sunday he would take part of the mass and expound on it as he was going through the mass. <coughs> and then the next week it would be a different part you know mm -hmm. following through consecutively yeah. um and i think that was helpful um for people mm -hmm. who had maybe not had instruction in a long time mm -hmm. yeah that's very helpful so next week, we'll do the following chapter, the, the next chapter, which is on uh, the theology of Vatican II. Um, it's, it's, really, um, it's a really good chapter. So uh, and it's, it's a re really, we tend to often to, we tend to focus in terms of Vatican II on the liturgy. And often to not focus on the theological underpinnings of Vatican II. Uh, 
and, and they're really important because Vatican II marks a significant sort of change or refocusing in theology that's really very, very important and you know, somewhat a different view of the relationship of the people of God, the laity to the church and to the broader world. Uh, so that's critically, critically important. So we'll discuss that next week.